good uh, good um, uh, morning to everyone in Europe and uh, good night to everyone in America. Uh, today we are um, presenting a parallel session 2D. Micro mobility is a tsunami for our sidewalks or, or an opportunity to rethink what sharing the road is all about. Uh, our lineup of speakers uh, will be uh, composed of Mario Alves, Sonia Lavadino, Marceline uh, de Jong, Alexandre Santa Cruz, and Pedro Homen Dugubella. Just a couple of uh, rule of thumbs uh, to uh, to uh, remind to keep in mind uh, while in the session. Uh, remember to write your comments in the chat. Uh, submit your answers in the poll section. Uh, view who is attending in the people tab. Ask the questions in the uh, moderated Q and A box and maximize your screen by either hiding the chat or clicking into the full screen uh, button. Uh, just to bear in mind, uh, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, all the recordings will be available after the conference and please keep your microphone muted when not speaking. Um, finally, after the session, uh, please uh, check the event chat, polls, the people and Q&A tabs. Uh, discover the upcoming sessions in 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 and the navigation panel to the left, uh, the tab sessions. Uh, try the networking function and sec send direct message uh, to other participants. Um, uh, I wish you a, a pleasant uh, session. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody is uh, listening. Um, so I'm Mario Alves. Uh, I am from the International Federation of Pedestrians, the Secretary General, and I will be managing this session with guests and uh, people that I've met and uh, work for many years. Uh, welcome everybody. I will share my screen just to tell you what, like an introduction and uh, how the, se the session will roll out. Um, let me see. Yes, I think. Yes, there it is. Um, okay, so um, so this, uh, as Danielle said, is a session micro mobilities, a tsunami for sidewalks, or an opportunity to rethink what sharing the road is all about. Uh, there is an L missing there. Uh, and uh, Danielle already said, uh, will be Pedro Govaya uh, from Polis, uh, Alexandra from ETS uh, Transport Forum, uh, International Transport Forum, myself. Uh, Sonia Lavadino from B, B, B Fluid, uh, and uh, Mayo Line De Young from 3 Day, but uh, Mayo Line had a very last minute uh, appointment, uh, health appointment, so it was impossible to be here, so she apologizes, but she was in the background and she will be, we will be using her slides and I will be presenting uh, some of our ideas and slides, so she is very much with us. I think she, she was at least in the, the in the in the session a while ago uh, i don't know if she's there now but uh, welcome to everybody um so let me um go okay so how the session will proceed um so first, uh, I'll be presenting a very quick introduction to the topic uh, by myself and uh, with my line slides that we did it together. And then we'll have short presentations of about 10, 15 minutes by Pedro Govaya, Alexandra and Mari Walvis. So Sonia, uh, uh, my line will not be presenting here. Um, and then uh, I will just show three slides uh, about the big questions about micromobility, so just to uh, open the discussion, so we'll have a time to discuss the presentations and the big questions uh, at the time, and then Sonia will, um, will speak about exploring the possibilities in the session that will be the tree, which will be the session uh, interactive game playing uh, uh, on new ways how to deal with public space. So basically in the beginning we decided to do these two sessions as one, but of course due to logistics and the, the organization we have to split them in half, uh, one and a half hour each. So it's very much linked these two sessions, so uh, I will um, uh, invite you to go. This is uh, this interaction session was something that we started in to, uh, with Sonia and Maya Line and Pedro in uh, uh, in Rotterdam, uh, Walk 21. As you can see, uh, it was very a lot of fun. People used maquettes. 
uh, we started by thinking of uh, doing online maquettes. Maybe it's possible, maybe it's not. We will have to, uh, to adapt. Uh, we will have to be adventurous session uh, but Sony also um, has videos that we can comment on real uh, public space so uh, don't worry we will uh, find a way that uh, to have a fun session uh, with a little bit more interaction than uh, usual uh, as you can see in Rotterdam in 2009 people were very excited to all these maquettes with the uh, with mock-ups uh, that's with Sonia brought uh, all these materials and people were having a lot of fun so um, what about uh, developments uh, and uh, what about micro micro mobility as everybody knows and there is this uh, um, site that is very good uh, herb I uh, there is examples here of cities around the world that have been changing public space from in the last 10 20 years as you can see uh, but all these public spaces and the way they change is uh, based on the classic uh, transport modes that we have been uh, working with in the past century which is pedestrians bicycles light motorcycles cars buses and trucks so this is quite a classic uh, there is this pyramid that pedestrians are always uh, the top uh, of priorities and then bicycles and then uh, motorcycles cars and buses and trucks uh, and this is there is a discussion maybe trucks should be a more priority than cars and that's something we all can discuss but that was more or less the scenario uh, that we had in this all these public spaces that you can see that did a lot of work so some cities did a lot of work on this uh, there is an example here from um, then the Hague uh, in Netherlands which is quite advanced on this but is still struggling with this uh, classic model can you see here from uh, 2014 uh, you know uh, a major road uh, and 2015 uh, the remodeling of that road but as you can see uh, it's still very classic you see so you have like the motorized vehicles on the tarmac and then you have the pedestrians on the sidewalk and then we have uh, bicycles and uh, mopeds uh, on the bicycle pass um, this was actually very controversial about 10 15 years ago the mopeds uh, were allowed on the bike passes in uh, Holland and uh, as if I know well uh, last year uh, they reversed this uh, authorization because it was getting a bit messy so then we start seeing that there was a little bit of a problem mixing uh, mopeds with bicycles and you know it was a bit of a mess for 10 years in uh, in Dutch uh, bike lanes but so this was the discussion should the mopeds or the electric speed bikes for example should go to the outside the bike lanes or not so this was the beginning of a big revolution but still now we have a big challenge in front of us yeah as you can see there is all these new modes even drones and uh, you know and electric uh, uh, cargo bikes that we don't know exactly what to do and it doesn't really fit this classic model that you can see that was actually quite good and it worked um, you know we can discuss if the bike lane should be at the level of the sidewalk or not but uh, it worked uh, but so as you know in the last uh, 10 years maybe five years because it was very fast uh, there is all this you know uh, the rise of the bike shares the from chinese companies and then the the the, uh, the fallout of all those companies and then there was all these viral photos there is this operators and we'll speak about this but there is other things happening in netherlands there is the bureau of Biro. i think it's bureau car i think it's italian um that is a car that maybe is considered um, micro mobility or not and that's a question that we have to pose and uh, for a moment when they arrived they were allowed on the sidewalks because there was no law but now there is a law in the netherlands saying that they cannot uh, use the sidewalks but this is something that will happen a lot in the future but not only there will be uh, bicycles that will be bigger with motors with electric motors it will be taxis and will carry people uh, tuk-tuks rickshaws and all that and the new kids on the block as you know with COVID uh, there will be a lot of deliveries and there is a lot of companies investing a lot of money on delivery robots so that's something that we want to discuss also because it's automated vehicles that um, are maybe a challenge to sidewalks uh, but there is all these kinds of devices that uh, people are using and they will I'm sure there will be more and more so just to sum up this is these were the classic modes 
but then we have this some with the electric support some electric uh, um, so they are moving ads sometimes for handicapped uh, now we have uh, faster bikes larger bikes as i said bikes with the sh uh, and we have of course uh, bigger vehicles yeah like delivery motorcycles and drones drones is actually something that we should uh, be aware of there is a lot of discussion about drones and that's something that we probably will have to discuss so what are the elements that are we going to discuss here the speeds the models the weights the distance the openness of the public space that's this the topic of this session um, but most of the roads um, this is in Paris, are still with a classic mode, okay? Um, with narrow sidewalks, the bicycle does not have a, a place. Um, and we have a lot of opportunities in front of us to rethink what to do with these classic spaces, which are probably most, uh, in most cases, uh, what to do. So there is this model that actually uh, comes, uh, Mondermann spoke, and that's a very Dutch model, which is uh, you know, a dichotomy between pedestrian dominant uh, places in the city center and then uh, car dominant. Uh, so, um, and that's a question, shall we divide the, the, the city in those two more or less paradigms? Uh, I have my doubts because there is a lot of intermediate spaces that are not pedestrian dominant and they are not car dominant, but we will discuss that. The other thing will be um, uh, urban environments. And I think now that um, WHO and the UN is pushing for 30 kilometer uh, zone, uh, uh, cities uh, as a standard, then we will start speaking about speeds of 10, speeds of 20, and even speeds of 50 for exceptions in the city. Uh, so, last slide of my introduction, what we will be discussing is mixing or separating based on speed, mass, vulnerability, density, how to mix, uh, shall we do shared, shall we do lanes for specific modes, streets for specific families, and direction of solutions. Uh, time, space, network, solutions, nudging, and so on. Uh, this is it. Uh, so I think this is the introduction. Uh, I will pass now to Pedro uh, to do the presentation. Pedro, can you come to the stage? Hello, Pedro. Nola. Ah, ah, there it is. There it is. Okay, Pedro, can you start? <laughs> you are not here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, good. Sure. Can um, you share share your screen and uh, and start? So Pedro is uh, going to speak in a more broad sense, uh, just before Alex, that will speak more about a report, a very fine report on micromobility that the ICF uh, did. And Paul is also did a very fine report how cities could deal with this new tsunami that, you know, uh, if it is worrying or not, if it is some, something we should surf or not. Pedro, your stage is yours. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Mario, for organizing this uh, session. Um, and uh well thank you for inviting me um I, I hope you can see my screen yes yes uh i'll assume yes so uh for those who don't know uh polis is the leading uh, european network of cities and regions committed to transport innovation myself i'm coordinating uh, work on two fronts here at polis uh, one of them is road safety and the other one is governance and um integration so Polis uh, really started uh, looking closely and working hard on uh, shared micromobility around three years ago, which is basically when um, in many cities uh, started waking up in the morning to find their sidewalks filled um, with bikes. At first, as you know, it was uh, some bikes from share the Chinese uh, shared micromobility companies putting on bikes. Then uh, uh, one, one or two years later on, it was basically um, e-scooters and also soon enough, many other um, e-bikes. So this happened basically uh, in 2017, 2018, and many cities really didn't know what to do. And that's when 
we started discussing together, uh, which is something we are still doing, about how to deal with the so-called micromobility tsunami. Now, for myself, I came to Polis uh, one and a half years ago. And before that, I was working in Lisbon. And I had worked for, when this tsunami arrived, I had worked for a bit over a decade uh, uh, on um, pedestrian accessibility and safety which was basically uh, making, uh, making it possible for people to uh, go around in their city in a wheelchair and making it safe for people with uh, visual disabilities to uh, use the sidewalks, among other things. So I must say, in all honesty, that when uh, the micromobility tsunami arrived, it was really felt as a tsunami. And it was very frustrating because it kind of pushed us back many years in terms of this new attitude about the sidewalks and the crosswalks that we have been that we had been uh, working on. And suddenly, um, <clears throat> something that everybody was uh, against, which was illegal, abusive parking on the sidewalks by cars, suddenly part of the uh, cycling activists were kind of having second thoughts about, yeah, cars, no, but maybe you know bikes and. Uh, e-scooters maybe that's not so serious uh, and it was really a very uh, difficult to make sense of this now moving on um three things i mean to put, to put it bluntly uh does does the did this uh, shared micromobility tsunami bring more uh, sidewalk clutter yes it did i mean still three years on from the arrival of Lime, Bird, and many others to our streets, uh, we still see uh, e-scooters uh, everywhere lying down on the floor. And that plays, poses a major hazard to people who have some motor, visual, or sensory, or, um, or cognitive disability. Um, that is a problem that really, we, we start to see some pilot solutions, some tests, but it's very frustrating because three years on, we shouldn't be in the pilot phase. We should be massively deploying uh, tried and successful solutions. Do Does it imply more risk for pedestrians? Definitely, especially for people who have a sensory disability, namely people who uh, cannot hear well or cannot hear who are deaf, people who are blind or who have a, a high visual disability, people with cognitive disabilities. Uh, this is a major problem. And also people who are more frail, like the elderly, like children, because having a young man uh, with a 70 or 80 kilos riding at 20 kilometers per hour in a sidewalk is a problem. And that's not just using the e-scooters. Now that we see a steep rise in the deliveries, you know, the pizzas, the, the deliveries and Uber Eats are going on everywhere. You know, they are running after the time set for delivery by the algorithm that's running their lives. And they really go around often um, in sidewalks and in crosswalks. And it poses a major threat. So, yes, there is a threat. And according to some of the numbers that I assume will be discussed, I mean, the, this, pipe, this uh, shared micromobility cannibalize public transport. Well, the numbers seem to show, in a way, that shared micromobility, more than substituting for car trips, at least in Europe, it is basically uh, substituting for walking trips and for public transport trips. And, which is not, none, none, of, none less of a problem, it is also generating more trips which is a problem when we consider that sustainable mobility necessarily implies reducing the mobility, the amount of movement uh, we make. So to put it bluntly, you know, these three major concerns, they are a fact, and it's not, uh, we should avoid any whataboutism and really discuss them uh, in an open manner. Now, the question is, them being facts, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about policy, strategy, principles it's not only about the, the facts it's about the key uh, you use to uh, uh, so understand to give sense to those facts to extrapolate the implications and also often you know this which is like they call it in cognitive psychology instead of calling it the box they call it the frame the frame we use obviously is what gives sense to the facts uh, and it's also what often makes us um, uh, impermeable to other facts and makes us choose one fact instead of others. So to see them uh, in a way. And, you know, really, uh, this is the second thing that, that strikes me uh, when I was still working at the local level was, you know, the way is my shared micromobility that bad? 
I mean, why are we looking at it as a disgrace? And especially, you know, why are pedestrians and um, car people aligned uh, in their concerns about shared micromobility? And, um, and so, I mean, what is the box that we have in our head? And it's very clear what's the box we have in our head. It's a box that, be, that has been manufactured uh, over the past century by millions and millions of dollars and euros invested in uh, marketing research, specifically in one topic, which is motivation marketing, uh, which is about uh, selling to people not based on, you know, rational uh, indicators of uh, efficiency, cost, etc., but rather selling them products, creating the need for irrational need to have products that speak not to their rational mind, but to their unconscious, irrational and deep needs. You know, the, uh, the need for validation, the need for power, the need for status. Um, and so what we know is that for many, many years, uh, cars uh, have been marketed as a symbol of status, power, success, virility. I mean, if you look at the picture, the, uh, the, phallic, uh, the phallic elements there, you know, the two balls, the shaft to the right, they're not there by chance. Um, it's, it's, it was, that's, that's how car marketing was designed and shaped. And in, it re in being, doing so, it really shaped our popular culture and popular attitudes, even among those who don't have a car. So this is, uh, when we look at things, uh, we think naturally, even unconsciously, that car is basically the yardstick by which to measure everything else. It also conditions the way we think about the future. Uh, I mean, is this the future? We have thousands of shared e-scooters and e-bikes on our, on our doors, um, which this, this wave is amazing. Um, if you talk like we've been talking to many of the uh, originators, of the parents of these startups, many of them have very deeply ingrained positive attitudes towards sustainable mobility. So they're part of the future. And yet uh, what we see is that most of the future, most of the discussion on the future of mobility still has four wheels. Uh, it's about flying cars. Uh, it's about uh, autonomous vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so th this, this car box also conditions the way we discuss the future. And so the question for, for transport uh, professionals and beyond um, is, is really, and, and for transport activists as well, sustainable mobility activists, the question that we face today is really to go, is pretty much the question, the, the, the challenge that they faced in the, in the 1600s, where Copernicus found out in Galileus that, uh, well, the earth is not the center of the universe, um, and it's not the sun going around the earth. And it's this Copernican, Cop Copernician shift that we have to achieve in transport nowadays. Uh, and to really admit that the center of the transport universe is not the private car. It has to be something else. Uh, and so, but that still conditions uh, the way we think about all things transport related. And that includes shared micromobility, which by the way, uh, why is it micro? Um, is it because of the size of the vehicle? Is it because of the size of the trip? Is it because the size of the importance that, that's given to it by policymakers? Is it because of the size of the lobby and the number of policy officers they have? Is it because of the size of the penis? Uh, if we talk about uh, these uh, unconscious things. And so uh, why maybe a first question would be, why do we call it micro? Is that the best name? But there are other issues to consider. I mean, what if it's what box, what frame then should we use to consider um, all things transport related nowadays? And well, definitely, I would say that the, the key here, the, the reading key here is uh, the biggest challenge of our decade, of this decade and of our generation is to accelerate the shift towards sustainable mobility. We have a decade to do so. And this is our last chance. And it will have serious, if we don't do it, it will have serious cons physical consequences, not only within our life, definitely, but also harder still for our children. And so who are alive now? 
And so, um, what, what if we apply that frame to look at what uh, shared micromobility means, maybe we can see other things. Well, definitely, we can see that uh, the steep rise of shared micromobility was pretty much a stress test uh, on our street networks. And it clearly showed that they're lacking. Um, why are people running the with e-scooters on the sidewalk? Well, obviously, because they're afraid to do it on the roadway. And why are they parking uh, e-scooters everywhere on the sidewalk? Well, because they have nowhere else to park, because often, the uh, because there is the monopoly of the private car over uh, parking spaces in cities. So it the, the, this steep rise clearly showed uh, that although we've been talking for over a decade about cyclable cities, you know, we're really, really far away from providing a decent alternative to people who don't want to drive a car. But it also provides uh, critical mass. Uh, again, over the past decade, people, you know, cycling advocates and sustainable mobility advocates have been, you know, thinking of ways to really push up the number of people using other modes of transport that not private car. Well, suddenly here it is. What are we going to do about it? And one of the things uh, here at Polis that we believe should be done, and we've been sharing this point of view with um, with e-scooter uh, companies, is that it's critical that they provide support to elected officials who are stepping forward with uh, road safety measures, uh, reducing the speed limits, and who are stepping forward to implement um, bike lanes. For example, you know they face by themselves, those elected officials who step forward, who have a skin in the game because they risk risk losing elections, uh, the next elections if they start taking out parking spaces, um, you know, they are on themselves, they're on their own facing like in, in my country, we have the this uh, particular thing in the in the bull in the bullfights, which is, you know, this one guy uh, trying to catch a six a, a 600 uh, kilo bull charging at him. Of course, he has others on his back who will, you know, kind of help him uh, secure the challenge. And we need shared micromobility companies to um, work together with elected officials to really, for example, mess their resources when new bike lanes are open. So that's an opportunity there. We also okay. need to understand. One minute. <laughs> oh God, um, great. We also need to understand that public transport is essential, obviously, to accelerate the shift to shared micromobility and public transport is usually marketed as the backbone, yeah? But public transport, uh, you know, 60-seater buses and subways, et cetera, you know, they, they lack capillarity. And, um, and so shared micromobility, specifically in suburban areas, can provide that capillary, can make it easy for people to reach mass transit uh, networks. So uh, to respect the time, um, I would say that um, it's more, then a question of complaining or running away from the tsunami, it's uh, because it's here. It's more about how can we uh, surf this, this tsunami? How can, because it brings opportunities. Um, and for that to happen, could I have like 30 seconds, please? I assume from your silent that it's a yes. yes go Thank on. you very much. Thank you very much. And for that to happen, um, there are uh, seven very quick things. Number one, we have to recognize that the issue with data sharing right now is, is a question of efficiency. It's not that shared micromobility companies don't want to share it, it's a question of efficiency. And we're working on that, you know, to make uh, common specifications, uh, protocols, catalogs of use cases, et cetera, et cetera. We have to understand that shared micromobility companies can have, to, have to look to the suburbs because in dense urban centers, people can basically walk. Now in the suburban areas, there is business and there is a high public interest to really provide other options there because their people are really stuck in car dependence. We have to understand that it's about creating an alternative ecosystem to a uh, private car. And so more than you know, being uh, worried about e-scooters taking away clients from uh, public transport, it's a problem in the city centers, but it's not gonna be a problem in suburban areas. They can actually feed public transport. And so they have to work together. It's a question of um, uh, shared micromobility companies understanding that they also have to put for, push for uh, road safety, not with helmets or high visibility vests, but actually getting into the political arena and fighting for lower speed limits and traffic calming. It's also a question of really solving the problem of parking on the sidewalks. 
and that means taking the cars off the sidewalks and creating a lot of parking spaces for bikes. It also means finally to reduce speeds because it's the best way to have these companies consolidate their business and having people uh, running the e-scooters on the roadway. They would do it if they're not afraid to do so. And finally, um, this is the last slide, sorry. It's about being very clear about a high standard of quality uh, in uh, the way we are implementing traffic calming, road safety policies, and specifically making our city cyclable. It's not only about putting in bike lanes, it's about making sure in a, some amount of streets, is making sure that people can run bikes, e-scooters, skates, whatever, safely, comfortable in the comfortably in the whole street network. And that can only be achieved by drinking the cup in full and really uh, implementing very strict road safety measures. That's it. I'm sorry if I took a bit more of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro, for your excellent presentation. Um, I think he gave us a lot of clues of what we'll be speaking about. Uh, Alex, can you uh, step on stage? Uh, Pedro, can you just leave the stage for now? Um, I think uh, it's a very interesting. One thing that called my attention while Alex is uh, sharing his screen is that uh, the idea of micromobility. I never thought about that because for example, pedestrians and cyclists were called non-motorized mode for, for a decade or so, which is a stupid way to call it, is what we are not. So micro, no, we are, you know, <laughs> why micro? It's because of the, the big car, of course. Um, but many, many things, I have a lot of comments with Pedro, it was excellent. Uh, Alex, you can start. Good morning. Uh, I guess you see my, my screen, uh, Mario. Yes, we can. Uh, Good morning to you all. Thank you for the invitation, Mario. Uh, it's an honor to contribute to uh, the Urbanism Next conference. Um, for those who don't know the ITF, I start with just one slide about us. We are an intergovernmental organization. We provide policy advice to 63 member countries. We are the only think tank that uh, delivers transport policy advice to cover all transport modes from um, from passenger to, to freight transport, and we include walking, of course. We organize, uh, as many of you know, the annual summit of transport ministers. So we've worked a lot on, on micromobility lately, uh, which is why I have the pleasure uh, of being here today. Uh, and let's dive into the, the topic. Uh, why, why do we see an anxiety of pedestrian? Where does it come from? Uh, well, this could be, maybe, because sidewalks are such scarce resources, as illustrated here. Um, pedestrians have so little of it that they must fight and fight hard to protect it. Protect it from motor vehicles, of course. Uh, Pedro uh, illustrated Alexander, it. Alexandra, we are not yeah? seeing the narrow sidewalk. Uh, you don't see the illustration? No, we are seeing still the flags. Maybe. Right, because I, I have flicked the, the slide a long time ago. Okay, no. Um, maybe reshare the screen, maybe? Uh, what or about now? No, still. Yes, me too. Oh, I see the right slide, so it's my problem. I'm sorry to everybody, I'm sorry to Alexander. I still okay, have... Okay, no worries. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm okay. glad it's working, I'm glad it's working. Okay. Uh, so where was I? Uh, yeah, protected from micro vehicles. Uh, Pedro illustrated that. Protected also from uh, bikes and e-scooters because there are more and more of them. So my presentation is simply about ways to protect sidewalks uh, and from, from micro vehicles riding or parking on it. Uh, so first, what do I mean by micro vehicles? So changing slide now. Uh, at the ITF, we propose to define a micro vehicle as one with a maximum speed no higher than 45 kilometers per hour and with a mass no higher than 350 kilograms. When you combine those two criteria together, what you do is that you limit, you put a cap on the kinetic energy of micro vehicles. So for the ITF, bikes and e-scooters do belong to the same uh, road user category that we call micromobility. Uh, of course, many of you will think this definition is too wide because it includes speed pedelecs, it includes mopeds, and Mario has very well explained that 
it is, uh, there is no consensus on what to do with those kind of vehicles. Uh, we are only giving a name to a large family. We do invite, of course, authorities to consider using more precise speed thresholds and or mass thresholds when they regulate specifically uh, what such vehicles can do. So how can we defend sidewalks? Um, to answer that question and to talk about the safety of micromobility in general, we held a workshop in Lisbon that involved uh, both sides of the argument, of course. We had International Federation of Pedestrians. We had also four companies operating e-scooters, plenty of academics, etc. We published a full report uh, that was the most popular of the ITF in 2020. It includes many recommendations, 10, uh, and I'd like to present uh, two of them uh, because they are relevant to today's discussion. Uh, number one, of course, pr provide protected space for micromobility. Um, here I insist on the word protected. Uh, we call for physical protection. A painted lane is not protected space. Um, that photo is from Paris, uh, in front of the uh, National Parliament. It's showing that the infrastructure can grow literally overnight, thanks to prefab components. Uh, of course, later this will be upgraded with materials that are nicer to the eyes. Um, there are still cobblestones that remain, that remains an open debate, what to do with cobblestones. I don't think they should be on, on lanes for, for micromobility. They give a good excuse for people on skates and inline skates, etc., to use the sidewalk instead. Uh, Pedro nicely explained why this is so important to provide space here, because without space, riders are afraid and they, they use sidewalks. Uh, if you need one evidence of that, have a look at Portland. Uh, it was a, one of the world's earliest e-scooter pilot, and they made uh, this one of their strong conclusions. Now, another recommendation. We call for the operators of shared mobility, uh, shared vehicles, to eliminate incentives for riders to speed. Uh, think of their pricing mechanism. It should not encourage riders to take risks to save a few seconds. Uh, by the minute, rental can be an incentive to speed, also to ignore traffic rules and right of way. So instead, trip-based or distance-based charges could, could offer alternative solutions. I read that the Swedish micromobility company Voy introduced daily and monthly passes. Uh, across all their markets. I think they deserve credit for that. But even though casual riders uh, will continue being charged per the minute, so that doesn't solve the, the whole problem. Uh, right, and if not everyone may be convinced that walking and micromobility exist in peace, uh, there will still be an argument on that. But I, I do think they can coexist, and here's one more reason. Some places in the world have decades of experience with, my, with mass cycling. Uh, so in those places, was cycling a threat, a, a tsunami to the sidewalks? Let's have a look. We, uh, we collected data from cities through the program we call Safer City Streets. And here we plotted the risk of a pedestrian being killed per kilometer walked. Copenhagen, came out, uh, Copenhagen to the left, uh, came out as the safest place where to walk. Yet, you all know, there were quite a few bikes in Copenhagen. Uh, can coexist with uh, One more piece of evidence here. Uh, we collected data, no more at city level, but at country level. We plotted here vertically, uh, the same indicator as before the risk of being killed per kilometer you walk. Look at the bottom. The Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland. Uh, Netherlands is probably the country where people cycle the most. Uh, so this is again evidence that cycling doesn't kill people. Um, and uh, I guess we should all learn from Copenhagen, from the Netherlands, as to how to accommodate vast numbers of people on wheels uh, using lightweight vehicles. Um, 
here's something else. Uh, in the ITF cycling safety report, we mentioned the experience of New York City. They, what they did, showed the effect and the benefits of a new uh, seven mile protected bike lane. Uh, and they realized that pedestrians were big winners of that. Their injuries fell by 22% probably due to the, the, the effect of a new bike lane on, on car speeds. Uh, so those protected bike lanes are part of a road diet. It makes everyone safer in the end. So now uh, let's talk about parking, how to prevent the clutter of micro vehicles. Here's a photo I took in Paris um, where local officials have experienced several micro mobility tsunamis it is fair to say uh, there were waves of oversupplied free floating bikes, waves of oversupplied e scooters, causing a big mess. Uh, Paris is a very big touristic city, and, and there was interest among operators. Uh, but now things have changed. Uh, Paris established 2,500 dedicated parking bays like this one. Uh, in fact, Paris officials have repurposed car and motorbike parking spaces. Uh, now the average distance between uh, micromobility bays is 100 meters. Um, and an, an e-scooter company dot, um, they reported that this availability of parking spots has increased compliance with parking uh, to reach 97% in 2020, they claim. Uh, this is the kind of information that you will find in, in that ITF report in the corner that will be published uh, this summer. And you can register for publication alerts on the ITF website. And of course, um, for, for this parking policy to work, there are carrots, sticks, and there must be guidance uh, in the e-scooter apps, for instance, uh, to know where, where users should, um, should park. Uh, on the technical side, GPS technology, does the trick. So that was about Paris, but Paris is not the only city to have solved the sidewalk uh, parking equation. Uh, researcher Anne Brown and co-authors on the field in several cities in the US, they found cars about 30 times more likely than e-scooters to be parked in ways that obstruct pedestrian movement. The morale of the story is um, preventing e-scooter clutter is important, uh, but uh, we're close to success there. And an obsessive focus on this could make us blind and make us miss the big picture. Bicycles and e-scooters, when they park, can actually enhance the urban streetscape in very tangible ways. And let me tell you why. Uh, when you remove car parking and create micromobility parking near pedestrian crossings, like, uh, like here at the bottom of my screen, um, what, what you do is that you prevent crashes at the same time. Uh, industry experts call this daylighting. Uh, it clears up the line of sight between pedestrians and drivers. NACTO reports that several cities in the US have already adopted this as a citywide policy. Uh, now my, on this example, there is greenery, but my personal view is that model, uh, sorry, micromobility parking is much better than greenery for this safety purpose. Uh, greenery can quickly grow big enough to become a mask and hide children. Uh, and also greenery is not strong enough to resist the assaults of SUVs or vans trying to park there. So micromobility parking is much better. Uh, here is one of the avenues explored to stop micro vehicles from cluttering sidewalks. This is a universal locking and charging rack for shared and private vehicles. Uh, but uh, I'm not doing publicity for them. There is a very long list of, uh, of companies on that market. So I've listed them here. Now I'll finish with that. In the US, uh, up to uh, shared e-scooter trips are replacing car, taxi, motorcycle trips. Uh, that's a, a very nice figure. In Europe, it is much less because we are not as car dependent. 
in Europe, you see figures of typically less than 20%. Uh, but the consequence of such mode shift is that cities can become less congested, less noisy, less dangerous, less polluted. So it is something to celebrate. Um, several ITF reports on the safety and on the life cycle impact of these scooters have demonstrated how much better they perform than, than cars, even than electric cars. Um, so I believe uh, this is good to keep this in mind when discussing any negative aspect of these scooters. Right, and so that's my last slide. Uh, I'd say that uh, the true tsunami that has flooded the streets of most cities is that caused by private cars over the last many decades and uh, the policy priority we gave to private cars. Uh, so for decades, we have narrowed sidewalks to create more traffic lanes. We dedicated every centimeter of curb space to car parking. Uh, now, the popular success of micromobility could be an eye opener. I hope it will federate pedestrian associations, make them stronger so they can address that real car based tsunami. Thank you for, for your attention. I'd be happy you, to Alex. answer your question if there is time and hear my details if you need to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you very much for <clears throat> your presentation. Uh, I indeed had some problems. Uh, your slides were not uh, passing, but I think everybody was seeing the right slides. It was my problem. I don't know what's going on. But I have seen your slides yesterday, so I will, could accompany uh, easily uh, what you were saying. Um, so now it's my turn. Um, I hope that will work. Please tell me if it doesn't uh, on the chat box because I will not be able to see you. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm seeing this, so I'll be speaking uh, on behalf of the International Federation of Pedestrians, which are the anxious ones, <laughs> as you said. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, we have been shortchanged. We have a lot of things with common with cyclists. We were the companions of unfortune. Uh, sometimes we fight with the cyclists and cyclists fight with us for the breadcrumbs that uh, the 20th century car paradigm left us, which is very unfortunate. I keep saying that, um, you know, uh, pedestrians and cyclists should be strong uh, together and fight together for better cities and better public space. And I think that should be the same for e-scooter um, which are the new kids on the block. So I think very much so. Uh, we welcome uh, these scooters because as uh, Alex just said, they are very good because even if they don't reduce a lot, uh, car driving, you know, uh, they are a contribution for uh, better cities, less pollution, less uh, dangerous traffic and so on. But there are a few things and um, I will uh, speak. This will be a bit different. I was jealous of your uh, Pedro and uh, and I like presentations because my presentations usually are a little bit more conceptual and these one are a little bit more activism based you know we are a little bit more strong on our uh, we want to keep our rights uh, yeah so my uh, my excuse is for that so um, one thing that is very important with pedestrians is that we are very sensitive uh, kind of uh, uh, persons we are universal so there will be children there will be people with alzheimer there will be all kinds of people and i think pedro covered that very well i took these photos just to see how these details are very important there is this garage this was in london when we were all uh, hyper mobile uh, you see all these devices were also a form of uh, um, micro mobility these suitcases they were all over when before covid you know uh, that was uh, one of the best invention in transportation systems in the last uh, 20 years. And uh, you can see here a very curious detail. I just took this photo from the hotel window in London, in Victoria. There was a lot of traffic for pedestrians. And you can see that pedestrians are bothered by a thousand cuts. You know, if there is, there was this problem uh, of, it's a comment on democracy of public space that this 
person or this designer of public space thought it was better to um, give privilege to this car that would go to this garage once a week or once a day and this would impact pedestrians, uh, thousands of pedestrians per day. So you can see some pedestrians are on the tarmac because they are avoiding these two uh, red lines. So this is, uh, you know, and you can see here something that is not very more much common in public space, which is pedestrian congestion and narrow sidewalks. And this is a very good sidewalk. There is really bad sidewalks. And with COVID, there is a lot of G um, GIS data showing that most cities um, don't have uh, enough sidewalks for keeping the distance and to make it comfortable for pedestrians. So just to tell you about the International Federation of Pedestrians, we are just about, we are in 40 countries, about uh, 50 NGOs. Uh, sometimes we are big, uh, like Living Streets UK or Victoria Walks in the and very professional Victoria walks in uh, uh, Australia and but sometimes we are just uh, you know a bunch of people that are usually volunteers uh, pedestrian activism is not as strong as bicycle activism because we don't feel that we have an identity a political identity so that makes it a little bit more complicated to be an activist of pedestrians um, uh, and you know but we have a very strong political point because we are 100 percent of the voters so that's a very interesting point in one way is a weakness in another way is a very strong point cyclists on the other hand sometimes is two three four five percent or ten percent so you know they are very strong uh, to make themselves big i'm a cyclist activist myself um, just to tell you that um, the International Federation of Pedestrians is working in a European project, which is more multimodal optimization of road space in Europe, which deals with a very interesting problem. Uh, as you can see on the left, there is the um, trans-European transport network uh, of roads. Uh, so there are roads that connect ports and harbors in Europe so that they are very, very strong for deliveries and heavy trucks. But this uh, network of roads, they get into cities and they start, when they get into the urban area, they start to interact with pedestrians, cyclists, public transport and so on. So we have five cities to study this kind of uh, situations when the, the Trans-European Transport Network gets, in, gets into the city. So we have Budapest, Constanza, Lisbon, London, and Malmo that are doing case studies. So I would encourage you to uh, go to our website where there is a lot of deliveries already. And some of the things that I will present here are already meditation that we are doing. Uh, internally and within, especially in the uh, International Federation of Pedestrians, how to deal with this issue. So as everybody said, and this is a pre-COVID uh, problem, uh, that with COVID these things really, uh, we had like a two-year uh, space to think about, but there was indeed a tsunami and I am based in Lisbon, Lisbon, Paris, Barcelona, the cities that have a lot of tourism, they had a really problem. Uh, that was not to be uh, ignored because suddenly we had a lot, a lot of companies uh, operating and there was a little bit of a laissez fair and not regulated system. Some cities uh, are um, regulating, as Alex said, uh, like Paris, Lisbon is also talking uh, with the uh, operators, but there is still a lot of problems to be solved. Uh, Okay, but uh, this tsunami you can see in this graphic that is from 2018, 2019. As you can see, um, the blue is a bike sh bike based uh, bike share. So it started in 2010, and then you can see that is probably overwhelmed totally in 2018 and 2019. That is not in the graphic by the scooters uh, scooter share. So indeed, there was a tsunami. Uh, the question is, shall we be afraid of it or shall we surf it as Pedro put it? Um, here is another thing in the US also, uh, how the, the situation in 2019, the dockless bikes, you know, that uh, we have, uh, they had like, you know, in three, four cities, uh, and then the scooters, the number of scooters and the number of rides per month. As you can see, it's totally changed the panorama uh, because like, Five years ago, we thought the dockless bikes were the future and we didn't see it coming. So we didn't see it coming, this, um, this tsunami indeed. And in Europe and all over the, the world, uh, we can um, 
we can see that uh, less in Australia, uh, but some cities like Lisbon or Paris, they had like eight, nine operators at the same time. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. And this is a report from 6T, which is a company, a consultant company that did a very, very good report uh, on um, e-scooters in, in France. And it can show that the e-scooter phenomena was all over the world, Asia, America, South America, everywhere. Um, just to give you an example from the same report, you know, like Paris, I cannot count here, but they would have probably like about 10 operators at the same time before they started regulating. And then uh, Alex already spoke about it and the situation now is much better. And with COVID, we see a lot of merging of companies. Some companies went bankrupt, you know, and there was a lot of uh, changes in the, um, in the industry. Um, so, uh, I'm going to just speak about like uh, what, uh, what kind of surveys were done until the COVID stage, because during COVID the situation were very uh, typical and there was not much studies to be done. But there was a survey in San Francisco with uh, 1,700 riders pulled in Portland, a 120 day pull uh, pilot and companies provided the data and supplemented by a rider survey. And in Europe, we have uh, France, uh, this um, 60 report that uh, surveyed Paris, Lyon, and Marseille with 4,000 euros. So that's a very, very good and in-depth study. And Brussels, it's a much smaller study, uh, 150 interviews of e-scooters and users. And Lisbon, uh, there is a study from the University of Lisbon that is observation counts. So they didn't speak with e-scooters, but they um, surveyed the scooters by observation, like gender, age, and so on. Uh, so what we have to, who uses these e scooters from these surveys? In San Francisco, is overwhelming male, 82%, white, 62%, affluent, 68% at a household income above $100,000. In France, is 66% uh, male, wealthy executives and students. That was the, the report from 60. In Brussels, was 70% men. And in Lisbon, the data in the North Business dis District was 87% male. So uh, we can see here that is, uh, there is a pattern. And I think this is quite uh, obvious from early adopters. Um, <laughs> We are probably in the beginning of toys for boys. I think that uh, creates a few equity issues because, indeed, if there is an overwhelming use by men, at least in the beginning, uh, we have to question ourselves, you know, uh, also this uh, gender equity problems and uh, also uh, social class, you know, uh, who, is, who is using these things. Uh, another thing that is very interesting from the 60, 60 report is the fact that, uh, in fact, it does seem that transportation or time saving does not seem to be the classic um, motivation. There is a motivation that is quite new for transport modeling and modelers, which is pleasant and fun mode, which is great. Cities should be fun, public space should be fun. And I think this is great. This is really a, a great thing that actually people say that they are using e-scooters because it's pleasant and fun. Um, and the possibility to take door-to-door -door trips actually is not very important, which is interesting and something for the discussion later on. Um, just to tell you that uh, in Europe, as Alex said, the number of trips substituted, this is the number of trips substituted you have here in blue, uh, taxis and uh, private auto. I think you can uh, read this. Uh, uh, Fits is bicycles in green, uh, 15%. So the trip substituted uh, by, by uh, e-scooter substitute 15% uh, bike trips. But on foot, the red is 60%. Um, trips, uh, uh, walking trips are being substituted by e-scooters, which is questionable because there are issues around um, uh, ecological impacts of e-scooters, the, the, you know, and this has been trying to be solved in the future with the lifespan of the e-scooters, but it's something we should discuss about. And this is, um, sorry, this was Brussels and this is Paris. And Paris, the scenario is not much different. We have 3% um, of private autos uh, substitution. So basically, e-scooters are not in Europe substituting very many car trips. Uh, on the other hand, they are substituting quite a lot, uh, the, the orange, 30%, public transport, and quite a lot of food trips, 44% uh, 
Okay, so this is something that we should be aware of. And I think Pedro already, uh, we talk a lot about these things, and I think Pedro already gave a clue how we should react to this. Maybe we should be more careful in the hypercenters where the strip substitution of cars um, is much lower, but we should probably give more layout, uh, leeway to e-scooters uh, on the peripheries, on the suburbs, where they can actually fit in to public transport and you know, help to create, uh, you know, and to, to conquer longer distances. So, uh, just to sum up, uh, but in uh, United States, the scenario is totally different. Uh, as Alex already said, around 50% uh, from 36% of trips in San Francisco would be taken by Uber or Lyft, which is quite uh, very, very good because Uber and Lyft are a problem uh, because they are, you know, 40% of trips of Uber and Lyft are just circulating around. Um, and, um, but still one third uh, people would have walked, which is a bit sad for us as International Federation of Pedestrians, but we are not jealous. Uh, Portland, on the other hand, 34% uh, of riders and 48% of visitors uh, took the e-scooter instead of driving uh, the personal car. So as you can see, the scenarios in America, uh, we don't have data on Asia, but I, I would guess that Asia with very compact cities, uh, the results are probably more similar to Europe than the United States. I don't know. We'll have to see. So uh, now in, in terms of regulations, uh, Alex already spoke about Paris, so I will not cover that. But San Francisco rejected the e-scooter after uh, and really and licensed rollout. And that's the tsunami in 2018. And then the pilot started uh, in 2018 with two companies. I don't know the situation now. Madrid, the city council in 2019 denied application of civil e-scooters operators and there were 18 companies interest uh, now the scenario after the covid is very different okay so we surveyed our members that's the advantage that we have uh, we are in um, about 40 countries and basically um, we have a little bit uh, clear view what's going on around the world there was all these associations that replied and we are kind of uh, having a, a position on this that is not closed I think we are uh, open to discussion and this is something that we should look at it and discuss um, so we are going for clarity motorized vehicles should not be allowed on the sidewalks except uh, persons with disabilities and I think this is something that for the long future might be the box that uh, Pedro was thinking about and I recognize that totally but I think we are a little bit uh, concerned so this uh, pardon me and I think we should discuss this and the easiest and fastest way to deal with these scooters and the law is to equiparate them to electric bikes pedelecs or bikes because the pedelecs are bikes so this is Alex already pointed out that and I think we agree on that uh, now, the, the autonomous micro vehicles, as you see, as you can understand, during the COVID, there was an explosion on deliveries. Uh, so there is a lot of companies like Amazon, Zali, Baba, and all that investing on micro uh, robots, deliver robots. And there is already cities like Pennsylvania that allow robots uh, on sidewalks at maximum speeds of 35, if I'm ro not wrong, which is criminal I, I have to say so that's something that uh, us as uh, international federation of pedestrians and our members are very worried because these devices are also very useful because they can uh, take out cars and delivery vans from the streets so they can reduce pollution they can be very positive but in europe and in most cities now we should aim for 30 kilometer hour streets and if we aim for 30 kilometer hour streets maybe the position of and the city the, the, the right place for these uh, devices could be the tarmac and the roadway and not the sidewalk. Uh, so that's something for the discussion. So basically, just to finish, um, we should really have a very broad view. So we are here modestly as the International Federation of Pedestrians. We have to fight for our rights, but we are very much, uh, we don't want to be on the box. Um, just to bring you in more, just as two slides, uh, Peter Jones, Professor Peter Jones in the previous project had cities in three stages. So stage one is the car stage, where many, many, many cities in the world are in the car stage. And then we have stage two, which is sustainable mobility stage, which is uh, many Northern Europeans like Amsterdam, uh, maybe London, Oslo and all that, they are in the stage two. But there is a stage three, which is the city of places, which is much more interesting. Um, so it's not about traffic calming and um, it's about creating spaces of fun. 
So my point here is Vision Zero was created 20 years ago. It's transform transformative, it's very good, but maybe we should start speaking about beyond Vision Zero. So what that means? Vision Zero focuses very much in zero fatality. And I think we should focus more on modal shift because if more people are riding e-scooters or walking or cycling, there will be much more safety. And that's quite something that we should convey very strongly. So instead of speaking about road safety, which is an Orwellian doublespeak, we should speak about road danger reduction. As Pedro said, we should target the origins of the danger. Instead of traffic calming, which is in engineering and sometimes ugly, we should more or less speak about trees, we should speak more and more like benches, we should speak about livability. And instead of an ethical imperative of Vision Zero, we should speak about a political, clear political choice. And I think this is it. Thank you very much. Um, I was not controlling my time, but uh, let's now, I think I stopped. There it is. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the Q&A. Please do use the Q&A. Uh, can you all come in, the people that were speaking, Pedro, Alex? There is a, a question uh, here in the Q&A. Alex, uh, can the tries happening in the UK serve as an example of other for other European countries for of policies, business model, infrastructure to support micro mobility and to learn potential of the mode itself. Um, Pedro or Alex, are you aware of the UK situation that you can comment on this question? Yeah, maybe I can uh, go first. I think it's very interesting that uh, the and the uh, entry of uh, shared micro mobility in, into the market in the UK uh, uh, was was uh, kind of blocked for a long time. Uh, and there were police members part participating actively in the discussions that we held uh, within our uh, governance uh, working group. Uh, and so, I mean, I think that the UK had the time and the opportunity to learn a lot about what was going on um, in, uh, in Europe, uh, as, as well as what was going on in the Americas, North and South. Um, and th this we see, I mean, that there's uh, several mistakes that we made that were not made in the UK uh, that informed the, the, let's say, the, the shaping of these trial. Uh, and so, yes, I think, first of all, they learned from what was helping, what was happening uh, everywhere. Uh, and now it's our turn to, uh, to look at what's happening in the UK and learn. I think there are several things we can learn from the UK, starting definitely with the trial approach uh, and with the way that many uh, UK, uh, British cities are trying to bring in other factors to the, to the, um, to the tenders that aren't purely uh, financial. You know, this concern about uh, social responsibility, in terms of labor, in terms of prices, et cetera, et cetera. That is something that we follow, and I think it's very interesting. Alex, would you like to add something to, to this one? Yeah, totally agree with everything Pedro said. Uh, and ultimately, I think we will uh, be able to learn uh, from them. They're learning from everybody else, and now it's going to be time for us to benefit from their trials. I will I will call Sonia to the stage because I think uh, she will be also a good contribution and she will make the bridge for the next the session, interactive session, uh, if she's uh, with us. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Martin Lefranc, um, he said that actually uh, there is uh, 1,200 e-scooter users that were interviewed for our survey. Uh, I did click very well, uh, very fast on this. I don't know. It is a Belgium survey. Uh, is anybody aware? Yes, Pedro or Alex, is anybody aware of this one? Uh, I just have here my window. Is a Bruxelles Mobilité Enquête uh, d'usage des trottinettes électriques à Bruxelles. Uh, can you... Um, uh, Martin, uh, can you say that if more or less confirms the data? Yes, no, it's another survey. Okay, very good. Martin, can you more or less confirm the trip substitution uh, that was between 3 to 8%, 10%, less than 10% uh, of car trips uh, substitution? Uh, because that's quite an important data that uh, there was this very yeah. small survey. Uh, uh, Mario, oh, if I yes, yes, yeah, go yeah, on, go on, Pedro. Yes, yeah, I, I think it's a, a very interesting aspect of the uh, Brussels uh, survey uh, about the French uh, 60 survey and very, very few others. It's their rarity. I mean, um, 
shared micromobility was all over the place, and yet um, there is so little uh, that we know uh, about the the users. Um, so much, uh, you know, there was so much discussion about data sharing, and yet, you know, uh, well, the the feeling I got often um, was that. Um, you know, people were talking about, you know, most of the discussions were informed by uh, impression, impressions uh, and not uh, and not our data. I mean, for example, some of the cases that you, some of the data that you shared or that Alex shared, you know, they are rare cases. Most of the discussion about shared micromobility, you know, expectations, who's using it, this and that, it was informed by impression, it was impressionistic. And, and the problem with uh, using, you know, common sense or my impressions uh, to inform discussions is that, uh, you know, they, our, our impressions are very uh, conditioned by a thing that's by a mechanism that well researched in psychology called the salience bias. Meaning, you know, it's not the, the it's it's kind of the things that you know just jump off the ordinary um, is what we retain or what call our attention or the confirmation bias, which is things that really confirm our thoughts is what we pick up uh, and we forget everything else. And this is to say that um, with e-scooters, as with motorized traffic, uh, the lack of data uh, and you know having discussions not informed by facts, but rather by impressions, really um, reinforces the status quo because we pick impressions that you know basically emerge from the status quo. Uh, and it reinforces the, the status quo. And it's a big problem because it makes, uh, you know, policymakers feel that um, there's nothing new under the sun and that, uh, and, you know, the shared micromobility is kind of a, a problem that, um, and not, in, and they failed to. Mario, if, if I may jump in. Oh, Mario, you're muted. Yes. Thank you. Because we talked about uh, substitution, substitution yes. of car trips, figures can go very low in, in big cities with plenty of public transport. Of course, there are not many car trips in the first place to substitute. Yes. Uh, but uh, when, you, when you think about, about that, think about night buses, for instance. Mm -hmm. They are mostly empty. Mm -hmm. Do they substitute a lot of car trips? No, very, very few. And yet, they are part of, um, of a toolbox that helps people envisage a car-free lifestyle. And, mm -hmm. and so you, remove, you, you, you can save money by re removing the night buses, but how many car trips will, how many car purchases, how many car trips will that generate? Mm -hmm. So I believe e-scooters are just one more tool in the toolbox, and, and especially for young people, they can now envisage a lot, dozens of different mobility options as part of mobility as a service, for instance. And that is, that is very precious, I believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I, Martha, I was, ah, sorry. Martha has some data here in the chat. Uh, people can read it uh, from the Brussels. Thank you, Le Martha. Uh, it's really nice that you share the, the report. I have it. It will be very useful. It's a very good report. 1,200 is quite good. Uh, Pedro, you can continue. Yes, uh, you know, building on what uh, Alex was saying, um, you know, if we want people to leave their private cars behind and to, we have to offer an alternative. Uh, and to offer an alternative, it's not going to be the bullet. It's not going to be a bus, subway, a bike, or whatever. It's going to be a diverse portfolio of other mode of other options and the thing is uh you know it, and it has to grow together because to, to provide a, an equivalent or at least approximate reliability versatility that the private car currently provides and you know maybe it won't be as reliable as versatile as the private car now is but it will certainly be cheaper, more affordable. So uh, I think, uh, but for that, you know, this alternative ecosystem um, ha has to grow. Uh, and what we see right now, I mean, when we talk about, you know, shared e-scooters cannibalizing on public transport and this and that, I think Alex really pointed out, you know, for example, I mean, we, we kind of think, oh, in the city center during the day, we kind of forget uh, what happens during the night. 
um, and you, you know, maybe they can, you know, maybe they are cannibalizing. Yes, because in in we, we fail to get the full result because we don't have all these alternatives growing. Um, it's I think it's going to be one case where the the the, the, the total is bigger than the sum of the parts. And we yes. need several parts uh, growing, yes. you know, to really be able to benefit. Yes, yes, I totally agree. And I will just point out that uh, it is important in a way uh, to understand that maybe in the city center, uh, this canal cannibalization takes place more often and more, uh, yeah, and it's probably more of a nuisance. Uh, and in the suburbs, uh, in the peripheries, it's probably less of a nuisance and more useful, which is something that is quite in, in terms of policy might be useful to understand. On the other hand, if we are going to do city centers at uh, or city areas, urban areas at 30 kilometers per hour, then, you know, we, we should encourage all those kind of modes. Um, that's not something that they should use uh, uh, the sidewalk uh, to circulate or to park as the daylighting, which is something me and Alexandra spoke in Lisbon. The daylighting example is a way of occupying public space for parking. And for example, sharing parking of e-scooters and bikes, for example, bikes activists that are always asking for parking. I, I was uh, speaking with e-scooters company saying, look, offer uh, Sheffield uh, parking, which is those simple parkings to the cities and do an abundance uh, um, parking and uh, you will be the best friends of cycling activists um, because suddenly they are offering something that they can share. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, bicycle activists get a bit mad with uh, uh, parking for bikes full of e-scooters, which is something that, I, you know, it's, it's terrible, but the, the world, everybody wants their own space. Um, so. Um, I think what I can share now, because I think I have, we have 10 minutes, uh, I can share now uh, questions that will be a little bit more open for the next session. And then Sonia will speak also about the next session, which will be very linked in the continuation of the conversation of this. 12 minutes left, exactly, uh, Danielle says. So I'll share my screen with the questions and then Sonia will explain a little bit what will happen in the next uh, um, a session. But Sonia, do you want to add something to the discussion so far uh, while I share my screen? I think what was really interesting is to see how in practice uh, cities do deal with it and when they start dealing with it then we see that the solutions are appearing. I really appreciated very much the fact that uh, when Paris really started to, to put the, uh, the parkings, indeed this problem which was horrid, I was in Paris all the time last the, the first year when this appeared and I was just all the time bumping into these e-scooters and it's true that now it's it's very much less the case you almost you, you really see they've been they've been civilized if I can say that and I think it's it's really the thing you really have to go for very pragmatic measures and indeed as, as we are all saying and we will see this in the videos in the next session as well uh, it's it's indeed a question of feeling secure and having um, space to do what you need to do. I mean, it's like everything. And I think it's actually a very big, micro mobilities for me is like the, the, the canary in the mine, you know, it's, it's, it's an indicator of the need that we really need to uh, re, re, repurpose completely our, our roads in terms of, of shared space. And I think we will have this problem more and more. And it's really important that we rethink uh, not just street by street, but the whole network. And that would be my main message uh, contribution to this session is that because we that's at least the way that I discuss with it with cities more and more is to make them think about the whole network of roads that usually cities have, which which is counted in the thousands of kilometers. If I take a medium sized city like, uh, say, Rouen or Grenoble, we're talking 2000 kilometers of streets. So I think we do have a lot of kilometers around there. It's not, we're not in a penury, we're not in a, in a, you know, in a, in a lack of space. We just are lacking uh, the right type of shared space. And that's, and I think we do have margins of maneuver there. So, but this should be thought at the scale of the full network rather than just, uh, uh the the one or two street streets or the way it is in each street exactly. so uh but we'll discuss this more in the videos i think the videos are really good in the sense that they show how people actually deal with it in the in the concrete situations where they are sharing the space 
and that's the point to the whole point of the I next think, session is yes. really to discuss this. I think uh, Danielle also say something that I didn't actually know that actually uh, people could participate. We are not going to do now because we have only 10 minutes, but that's an enticement for the next session, um, which is uh, what's the number, Pedro? Uh, <laughs> two E, I think. Two E? No, two E is this one, I think. Is that? Oh, is it? Yeah, I don't know. No, this one's 2D. It's 2E. It's 2D. 3E. 3E. Three, three, yes. 3E. Uh, exactly. So three. an enticement. Exactly. An enticement to participate on the next session because we will open the stage. I think that's a very important thing. People, uh, I think Daniel uh, Martin, for example, had a lot of things to say, I'm sure. So if he could be there, it would be really useful. Uh, we are going to put on the questions. Uh, we will not be able to answer, but the next session in the 3E, uh, we will speak about them. So let's see what's the questions. And then Sonia will speak a little bit about the session uh, in five minutes so um, okay so the first question will be uh, device topologies which uh, modes belong to my more mobility family um, okay so so for example those mini cars that are very popular in Netherlands and they are they were allowed on the, on the sidewalk are they they are 350 kilos according to the ITF uh, maybe they are micro mobility uh, we don't know. We have to, to figure out. I think uh, you, once you start putting boundaries, I'm sure the industry is reacting to challenge the boundaries to make it car smaller. So this will be a cat and mouse kind of game. Uh, nevertheless, there is also the doubt if, uh, for example, bicycles are micro mobility or not. A lot of people ask me that, and I don't have an answer, and I am a professional <laughs> speaking about it. So um, is mm, some people say yeah if they are shared the bicycles are micro mobility if they are personal they are not micro mobility so it's it's a it's a bit of a mess uh, so it's not very important but uh, even the name micro mobility maybe should be rethinking for example uh, the non motorized modes now we prefer to speak about active modes or desirable modes so you know maybe we should change micro mobility name so the other thing is there is also a family between micro mobility and the car family family you know there might be other families uh, after the micro mobility family okay um, like the mini cars that i was speaking about pedro you can just ship in if you want as long as it's cheap it's quick yes uh, I, I find it uh, fascinating that yes. uh, we we discuss what we should call uh, you know finding new names for walking cycling etc cetera, etc cetera, when yes. the real challenge of promoting sustainable mobility is what in what we should be discussing is really yes. what new name should we come up to designate motorized for modes? The, for the cars, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like the, the selfish mode, the dangerous mode, uh, the polluting exactly. mode. Exactly. And instead That's of you know, trying to brand ourselves. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, there is something that uh, all the, the activists discuss. Shall we promote only our modes or shall we be uh, attack, attacking the car? Uh, that's a very common dis uh, discussion and we might discuss that in the next session. So the urban typologies is also very important. Uh, could different zones be based on the combination of weight, size and speed? Uh, so that's something that we have to uh, also speak about. So, the other thing will be about speeds. So if we accept as the desired future, the standard of 30 kilometers per hour speed limits in the city, like the WHO uh, advocates in the past few months in the United Nations. And if we know and want because of climate change and all kinds of things, COVID, a drastic reduction of private cars in urban areas, does it make sense to segregate spaces in the long future? Maybe bike lanes are something of the transition phase or the, the car paradigm phase. Uh, maybe in the future we don't need bike lanes in most of the city if it is all 30 kilometers per hour with very low car traffic. Uh, how can we plan for the transition for the long future for the 30 kilometer hour? Because there, then we will start, when we start speaking about the 30 kilometer per hour city, then we can start speaking about the five kilometer hour zone the 10 kilometer hour zone 10 20 kilometer hour zone and eventually some exceptions for the major roads 50 i admit that's a possibility of course so we always keep an exclusive and protected space without motorized devices and barriers for most vulnerable users uh, like children elderly uh, people with alzheimer what we call now the former, the, what would be the former sidewalks. Uh, I think that's something that is a question that is very dear to the International Federation of Pedestrians. Should be always a space that there is no entry of uh, motorized modes. Finally, 
the micromobility lanes. Shall the bike lanes become micromobility lanes? I think now we start seeing that the standards of the car paradigm for um, uh, bike lanes was one meter and a half. Uh, which is ridiculous, uh, sometimes a minimum of 1.2 meters. Uh, I think now if we start speaking about micromobility lanes, maybe we should speak about minimum of two, uh, two meters <laughs> or recommended two meters and a minimum of one and a half. Is there a need for a speed limit in those micromobility lanes? Uh, you know, uh, 20, 30 kilometers per hour, 25 kilometers per hour, like the pedelecs have a speed limit? Should e-bikes the speed pedelecs uh, or other heavier or fast uh, vehicles should be allowed on these micro, micro mobility lanes, uh, given uh, when the traffic is at 30 kilometers per hour. Maybe in those uh, 30 kilometers per hour, should, we should not have micro mobility lanes uh, if the traffic is low. So these are the questions. I'll pass to Sonia. Uh, Sonia has four minutes to speak about the next session, but we will discuss all these, these uh, questions in the next session. Um, Three, three. The idea three. is that we start with these videos. I will show videos from different cities and including uh, good, such a considered good cities in terms of uh, solutions for, for shared space. And I think it's interesting to see how these, uh, the, I, I would say the, 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 the fact that there is much more diversity in the, in the means of doing these micro mobilities uh, adds complexity to the, to the way that we share. So the idea with the videos is to show in real-time situations how people deal with it and how the different solutions that were implemented in terms of the, the urban design uh, contribute or not to these conflicts being um, better solved or uh, resulting in, in, in near misses of, of, of accidents. So uh, we'll, we'll see about uh, 10 different videos. And then um, if uh, we have... Uh, uh, time we, we will, I mean, the idea is that we discuss the videos and we have uh, time to share about them and, uh, and to give innovative solutions in terms of the way that we could uh, um, uh, solve these design problems and, and try to think about other ways of, of doing it. And I will also show some videos where we actually uh, did solve these problems with other types of design. In the beginning, we thought we would do an interactive session where you would, uh, you guys would build yourself the, your own solutions. I think that's that's kind of hard uh, to do within uh, the, the, the the situation that we have here around around the screens. But uh, build, please feel free to to really chip in with uh, maybe some drawings of solutions that you would think or or um, simply sharing uh, orally. And the idea of this uh, session is to be very interactive. So after each, uh, the videos are very short. They're like two or three minutes showing really the, uh, the actual situations, how people interact. And then the idea is that we have little discussions each time also about uh, two or three minutes each where you guys can chip in and give your ideas about how we could uh, do things to um, solve very, very pragmatically the situation that we were seeing on the videos. Because the videos really show the interactions and I think it's always important that we see, me as an anthropologist, what I'm really always considering is how the actual uptake of the spaces that we draw in our cities. And, and I think it's really nice to have this feedback and see how people actually use the space. So that's Sonia, yeah, yeah. one minute. Yes. Okay. Very good. Excellent. Um, excellent, Sonia. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, the open platform is not we uh, for doing this maquette and to do something similar to what we were speaking uh, in Rotterdam, that we had a lot of fun with maquettes and objects. We were thinking of using uh, home objects, like kitchen objects, uh, to, for you to do maquettes. But I think Opin is not really a, a ideal platform for this, um, to break in in rooms. So I think maybe we go for the option of videos and to uh, opt with videos. So that's, uh, that's fine. And I think we'll be very interactive. So uh, we will open the screen uh, for everybody and everybody can speak more, uh, which we didn't do in this session, uh, which I regret. I think Martin uh, will have a lot of things to say about his report and a lot of people, I know they are professionals, they have the same question as us, we don't have the answers or we don't have all the answers. So uh, now it's 10 o'clock, um, my time, uh, 11 uh, CET. So I think we, um, thank you everybody, uh, thank you to the speakers and uh, I hope to see you in the session three, um, Oops.
I forget all that, 3E, um, the session 3E, where we will be continuing the discussion uh, about this, um, which is not exactly a problem. The problem are the cars, of course. Uh, <laughs> I will be very looking forward to hear how you deal with it uh, really in your cities, and I will have examples from Zurich, Copenhagen, and uh, um, uh, Gottborg and other cities, uh, Paris, and uh, it will be lovely to hear also about your own cities. So, just one point, but... Pedro. Pedro will leave us because he's doing all this uh, backstage with the uh, police and uh, organizing the the conference. But we will be uh, joined by the wonderful Maria, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I think she's here. Yes, Maria Jose Rojo from Polis. And she will be also uh, chatting with us uh, with, about the video. So we'll be having a round table with much more participation of the public. Thank you very much and um, see you later. Okay. See you then.